A lot of familiar faces here. Nice to see them. Um, who, who's uh, first time is it out to one of these? Oh wow, that's actually pretty high. Usually we have about like half the people are returning, half the people, yeah. Thank you. Uh, usually it's about half and half, uh, but it looks like we've got a bunch of uh, new folks. I'm guessing it's because of Austin, because you all look younger. <laughs> uh, I'm all gray here, guys. There, you, you guys are the TikTok audience, that's why. I don't even know what TikTok is. I think it's a clock. I'm with you guys. Gen X. Uh, anyway, it's great, great to see your face in the audience. Um, let me just go for a couple of things. So, high level agenda. I'm going to go through Matt's presentation. We're going to go through Matt's presentation first. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a networking break. Highly encourage you to go talk to people. Just Everybody here is interested in real estate. If you're looking for a topic to talk about, ask them what they're doing in real estate. Uh, I'll, I'll say, I say this all the time, but literally your network is your net worth. Um, the story I tell is, I was you know, a young investor, talk, uh, for my first time getting into development, I was talking with somebody in the hallway about it, and they're like, oh, that's nice, have you got a plan? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm talking to this guy in the city, and they're like, no, do you have an urban plan? And I was like, I can have an urban plan? I didn't even know that job function existed. Um, that conversation saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes. So, you know, go talk to people, you never know what they're up to, uh, hear their stories. Okay, housekeeping items. Please, pay your bills. <laughs> Just a reminder, uh, support the local business. We're very nice to have us here every every month. Uh, have a drink, have something to eat, food here is good. Beer is made downstairs. Um, washrooms are right below us if you're looking for them. Uh, something's assigned, please. Oh, don't worry about recording stuff. We do have recordings. Uh, they'll be posted to our website afterwards. And, oh yeah, make sure you're on our email list. If you, we regularly send out deals that are happening within the city. Um, Can I get If our clients haven't taken them first, but <laughs> we regularly send out deals that are in the city. Uh, so if you're on that list, you'll get notification. Ah, legal disclaimer. Uh, it's all very small. You can sit there and read it for a bit. Uh, basically, the, the gist of it is, if you don't like what you're hearing tonight, you can leave. Uh, that, that, is the, that is the exclusive remedy for dissatisfaction. So, any questions, comments? Awesome. So who are we? Um, basically, we had started, uh, me and Matt were both investors, not knowing each other, investing in all different sorts of places around Canada. We met, let's say, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, um, both also investing in Toronto. And we kind of had a bit of like, uh, we really hit it off because we had very similar philosophies about investing. And we started, we created this company because we realized that the things that pe our friends and family were coming to us with questions, um, we could make a business out of it, to be quite frank. People, we could support people along the way. So, uh, our mission statement is to help people navigate the context of real estate investment. We have that uh, slide up there on the top of the picture. We try to be that eraser. Uh, because there's so much, and there's like there's an infinite number of possibilities. So we try to look at things like, you know, what your risk appetite is, what are you trying to achieve, and help develop plans for that. Uh, we're a complete solution provider. We do everything, uh, we do a lot of things ourselves. For everything we've done to ourselves, we have partners with it. So we teach, that's things like tonight, we have guest speakers, uh, we execute the realty side, we have our relation realty team, we do construction, we have a community as well that supports real estate investors. We synthesize our research, so it's one thing to hear the numbers, it's another thing to, like, what do you do? Right, so that's what we'll be going through tonight, that's gonna be Matt's segment. We know certain things are happening in the market, how do you, how do you take action on that, that data? Uh, and the last thing is we come from experience. We all have you know, pretty decent portfolios, which we've created all the years. We've both been investing for a couple of hundred years now. Uh, yeah, everybody on the team's in the So these are the four areas I talked about. We have advisory, Matt runs that side. This is the creating of an investment plan. So a lot of times, you know, these days there's so much information out there on investing, but 
none of it is actually tailored to your specific situation, right? It's, it's generic information on whatever you see, YouTube, Twitter, whatever. Um, we do consulting, so you sit down with Matt, go through your portfolio, analyze it, talk about what needs to be done, what, what we would suggest be done to it, um, and take it from there. Next thing is Realty. That's my team. So we're a bunch of investor-focused realtors. We have deep understanding of you know, investing. Was it blogger? Yes. Yes. Here's the beers. Thank you. Thanks for buying the beer, Alan. <laughs> Um, it's more local. Um, so we take the plans that are often created in advisory and we execute them. Right? So sometimes it's like, you know, I'm looking to buy a house where I can do a fourplex conversion. I need to make sure that I'm hitting legal base and ceiling height, that I've got enough uh, side setback on the property, that I can have a rear entrance. Does this neighborhood support uh, you know, a front basement walkout? So the realty team has deep understanding that kind of stuff and we execute those. Uh, next part is renovations. We support clients through renovations. We're not contractors themselves, but we act in a project management capacity. So a lot of times we have to do renovations and projects to make our real estate a new And lastly, community. So we have a uh, chat group, we have this, these meetups as well. Just so real estate investors get to know each other. It's really important uh, to have power for last year. Uh, this is the team. We've probably met a bunch of those. Wilson and Arthur on the front. Me and Matt are retired today. Wilson over here. You guys want to stand, stand and take a wave? <laughs> I don't know if Wilson's on. Wilson is his pectoral. He's too much lifting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and these are our, our, our team values. So I put this up here because you know, these are a bunch of things. This, these things really do matter to us, but what we're going through tonight is the education part. And where's the godness? We've uh, invested hundreds of millions of dollars with our clients. It sounds crazy to say that, but it's true. <laughs> we've been on uh, HDB, we've been, uh, we put Rise up here, we've been on uh, Rise Podcast, and maybe again shortly. Uh, and we've got a bunch of awards as a result. And this is just a reminder for our clients in the room, in case I've missed you, in case we've missed you, please let us know. We have an exclusive, uh, Mastermind, giant WhatsApp chat group, just for everybody to support each other. Uh, we're gonna have real estate questions like pending rate changes or raccoons in rooms. We talk about that to save space. Okay, market updates. Let's talk about what's happening in the market. Usually we have this like uh, the slides. Uh, showing volumes and stuff like that, but to be quite frank, the data is out of date already. We're three weeks into October, and that data is lagging. Like it's created at the end of every month, and it lags uh, from that. So I want to talk about what we're seeing. In the last I don't know, three to five weeks, maybe six weeks. We've seen prices in certain areas and certain properties just crater. Um, we, like me and Austin were chatting about this before. Uh, he had sent me this, uh, was it a semi or a townhouse in Trinity Bellwoods? Townhouse in Trinity Bellwoods. It was, it was a small lot. It was under a million bucks. And if you're familiar with the neighborhood, there hasn't been properties transacting under a million bucks in Trinity Bellwoods in like four years maybe. Like and this is a turnkey property, it wasn't uh, like a uh, teardown. So sellers are starting to get best. They've now been living with these high interest rates for a little while and some of them could have can hold out, but a lot of them have got to the end now and they need to sell. Right? Unfortunately for us we have ten listings right now. And unfortunately for our sellers, it means that you know they're gonna they're gonna be all taking hits. Um, but that's the reality. This is what we're seeing now. We just did a one here in East York on Donlands. That property peak market was on like one three five. We picked it up for one one. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And this is like peak market. I'm talking about earlier this year. Um, you know we're seeing investment properties with cap rates above five percent in Toronto, like, you know, Primo locations, like, uh, Lauren Osington, um, and trading at caps over 5%. This is like, 
if the market is falling. And um, I don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, every time, uh, it's not been many times, I sit, sit here and talk about the client to the market. It, it doesn't last too long, traditionally. I don't know if it's going to go into the winter. I don't know if it's going to go past the winter. That's a very hard crystal ball activity to do. Um, but I can tell you what's happening right now. So the flip side is it's hard to execute in this market because interest rates are really high. Uh, on the way here, I was having a conversation with uh, Hugo, who spoke last week, and one of our clients. And our client's jump rate is 9.5%, right, for qualification. That's nuts. But that's also the reality right now. So, yes, things are cheap, but it is also going to be harder for you to mobilize funds to be able to buy. If you're in a fortunate position where you don't have to deal with a 9.5% jump rate, uh, there's really is opportunity right now. Uh, expiring wing holds. So, uh, one thing we are seeing as well is there's a bunch of people who have kind of got mortgage qualifications through uh, summertime and their qualifications coming up. Their, their 90 day hold is, is ending. And I know this because we represent a ton of buyers. Our, our buyers are motivated because that's the difference between them getting a mortgage at 5.5% and, and a mortgage at 7.5%, right? So they're trying to execute as fast as they can right now to hang on to those good rates. So we're seeing some of that. Um, and then I have a bit of a theory as to what is selling and what isn't. Because while I am seeing prices drop, there's a couple of things around it. There's still some bidding wars. Like if you're keeping a very close eye on the market, there's certain properties which are still going to multiples. And there are some properties which are selling still quickly. So why is that? Um, I wish there was good data around this. So I have to draw just from what our team is going through right now, which is a much smaller data set. But one thing I've noticed, my theory is that properties that are moving right now are properties where the purchaser is less affected by rates. And what I mean by that is we're, we've seen multiples on a couple of properties that are complete teardowns, guts, likely because that person is closing on private anyway. Yeah. Right? Like it's in a in kind of condition where getting regular aid financing is likely not going to happen. It's a contractor, so they're likely closing on private. For them, private money hasn't changed. It's not like it's gone from like 9% to 15%. It's still like eight to ten percent in private lending, right? So that's one. So I think that that is part of what we're seeing, and it's corroborated by what we're also seeing in the luxury market. So sales of homes that are over three million dollars, people who are buying three million dollar plus personal residences, they're not putting ten percent down in their CBC, right? Most people who are buying three million dollar residences are actually having relatively large down payments. Um, you know, most of these mortgages are actually not above a million dollars. So for them, this is a much smaller portion of their um, purchase is being affected by the interest rates. Because we're still seeing the luxury market, right? There's still people who are executing this. Now, their prices have been affected, but there's more transactions still happening out there. And the other thing that Florence brought up to me the other day is like, you know, the luxury tax for $3 million plus homes is imminent, right? Uh, next year is it going to be? Something like that. So anyway, it's coming in, law's been ratified. So I think there's also, sorry? It's in January. January, so there you go. So, so I think there's get a Get up there and buy your $3 million yes. home now. <laughs> Do it now. So, so I think that is causing pressure on the luxury market as well to pick up these properties and close before the tax comes in. Any questions about the market, about what, what we're seeing? We're extremely boots on the ground. Like we're, we're out there hitting the pavement. All day. <laughs> yes? Jump rate. So jump rate is the, um, uh, what do I, how can I say It's the buffer that a bank will qualify you for. So let's say your actual mortgage is 6%. They'll add another 2, 2.5% two to your uh, mortgage amount to make sure you can still qualify, just in case the rates go up to that amount, right? So, um, yeah, that, that's that's kind of the jump rate. Machine. So it's like a, it's a bit of uh, stress test security for the bank to make sure that there is an upward movement in rates that you can still pay for your mortgage. Right? Um, any other questions? No. 
Are you sure Matt's gonna talk? This will be our last chance to talk. That's you, Matt. This is me? Oh. Yes. This is uh this is our our famous Oracle of Omaha's quote, be fearful what others agree with others are fearful. And I think that one of the things to keep in mind is there is fear in the market. There's actually fear as a, as a buyer, right? And I think fear comes from buyers because they're worried about, you know, am I getting the bottom? I'd rather buy on an up. And I'll tell you, it's much worse to buy in a rising market than it is to buy in a declining market. You're never going to be able to time the bottom. It's, it's very difficult to do. If you were to try to time it, seasonally, winter, if you go back and look at the data, winter tends to be out time, right? There's less volume, prices do come down during the winter. But um, trying to time it overall, like in the overall cycle, it is very difficult. But it's easier to buy in a down market because you can negotiate. I'm getting inspections and financing conditions. We don't get these things in Toronto. Like, I've written 10 times the amount of completely firm deals versus those out of conditions uh, you know, in my career. So, you can do things like that. We, get, we have clauses that say, if you don't uh, get your tenants to verify their, what they're paying in rents, you owe us three months additional rent for every tenant. But we're, we're asking for some pretty ridiculous stuff right now, and we're getting it, because the sellers are in a position where they, they don't have other people to work with, right? So, you know, it is the kind of market that we're able to ask some unreasonable things. Okay, what do you say? Well, thanks, Ming. You uh, ruined my presentation. <laughs> He's basically given the punchline, so we can all go home now. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name's Matt. Um, I'm founder and managing partner here at Volition. So thank you for coming out. This is, uh, I see a lot of fresh new faces, so it's really exciting to be able to share this with you. And the question is, what are we sharing with you here today? So you're, you're probably here to see Austin, right? But I want to give a little sizzle before he gives the steak. Or, well, are you the steak? Or are you the, you're the sizzle. I'm the steak. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I wanted, to, I wanted to continue the segment that we started last week, but, uh, last month, but we didn't get a chance to, to uh, really sink our teeth into it. And the question that I'm being asked time and time again is, should I buy now in 2023, or should I wait in 2024? Who here feels like this, is, this question is a source of anxiety for them? Don't be shy. Oh, you all have crystal balls? You, you know exactly what's happening? Come on, come on. Who, who here, who here is, stays up at night or is kept up at night by this question? Only one. Okay. Right. Sounds like the, I should just skip this entire segment and uh, let Austin come here. <laughs> I'm going to get into this anyway because I think it's a worry. Sorry, question? Okay, I'll just question. No, no, no. I'm, I'm agreeing with what you said. Uh, okay, I'm finally got another supporter. Alright, let's go. But first, before we get into that, let's have some fun with inflation. So, uh, you saw this, I got a kick out of it, maybe you will too. Dear Black Friday, we all already have big screen, big flat screen TVs. Please put groceries on sale. Yes. Yes. Damn inflation. The new inflation numbers came out. Did you see them? What was it? 3.8%. Is that good or is that bad? It depends. It depends on who's saying <laughs> What's target inflation rate? What are they trying to get it down to? Two? Two, three, right? Uh, last time it was still at four and they raised rates, right? Remember, uh, it takes six to eight months for in, uh, raised interest rates to work their way through the economy. So keep that in mind. All right. Oh, I'm gonna start my timer. I'm gonna start my timer. Make sure I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, already, I'm already five minutes in. I've, I've blown for five minutes. I'm really bad jokes. Okay, my agenda for the next 45 minutes. I'm gonna speak really fast now. Three real life volition investors. Three real life case studies that we're gonna go through here today. Right? We got uh, first got Gina. 
And next we've got Tommy. And the last one is uh, John, um, I think his last name is Bon Giovanni, right? So we got uh, Tommy, Gina, and bon Gio John Bon Giovanni. We're gonna talk about them. What are we actually gonna talk about with them? We're gonna talk about the property they actually bought, like the Bar of the Dream House there. And we're gonna talk about what they bought and when they bought it relative to uh, the market conditions at the time. Uh, next, we're gonna go on a little bit of an educational tour, right? I'm gonna, instead of just telling you, you know, a bunch of real estate theory, I've infused it into the case studies to make it a little more interesting. So, we're gonna have a little, more, a little bit of education, and we're gonna go on a little bit of history lesson with regards to interest rates and its effect on the market over the past year and a half. And then finally, we're gonna talk about double dipping. So, uh, who, who in here is a Seinfeld fan? Yeah? Does that look familiar? You dipped? You took a bite, and you dipped again. <laughs> we're gonna talk about double dipping, and what the hell that actually means. All right, let's get into it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I think this is supposed to be for Austin and his joint venture presentation, talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly for joint ventures. I stole it, and I'm gonna use this, the good, the bad, and the ugly for three real life position investors. Number one, the good. That's, that's Gina. Let's start off with Gina. Gina, Gina the action taker. And next we move on to the bad. That's Tommy. Tommy the wait and seer. And finally, we're going to finish off with the ugly. And so, the ugly is that, uh, I don't know how you can call that ugly. Look at that handsome devil there. John Bon Giovanni and, the, and his catastrophic timing. Who here is a Bon Jovi fan? <laughs> this is, you guys don't get, you, you're not getting this at all, right? <laughs> Alan's getting it. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Let's talk about Gina. So, Gina. Gina is a volitional client. Gina, she she approached the market in 2022, mid 2022, when everyone else was freaking the hell out. She approached it with a clear head and a clear mind, almost zen-like. She wasn't caught up in the fray with the hysteria and newspaper headlines. She was like totally centered and monk-like. And why was this good? It allowed her to take advantage of the market conditions in the middle of 2022. And I'll get, well, do, do you guys remember what was happening in the middle of 2022 last year? What was happening? What was happening? Yeah, yeah? Rates were starting to go up, and then, and then what was the market sentiment at that time? Market's gonna crash. Market's gonna crash! Oh my God, interest rates, oh my God. Right? Market hysteria. People were freaking the hell out. Not Gina. Gina was doing yoga, she was meditating, and she took massive action, kicked some serious ass. What did she do? So she took advantage of the market conditions in, in mid-2022, and it was a down market during that time, mid-2022. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some, some data later. What did she do? She bought a property that was previously worth about 1.6 million here in Toronto, a triplex, for 1.35 million. Previously 1.6 million, she bought it for 1.35 million. It was about $250,000 off uh, market for peak pricing. It was amazing. And it generated about $7,500 in rent. Like Ming was saying, this is what I'm saying, Ming like ruined my presentation, because uh, he basically told you all this already, but, Gina got conditions in her offer. In a Toronto market, in a Toronto market, it's insane. Who here owns a property in Toronto? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Who here had to go through a freaking bidding war to get that property here in Toronto? Really? <laughs> That's uh, rather surprising, I mean, it, it depends. But generally speaking, in the areas that we service here in Toronto, and in the investable neighborhoods in Toronto, where Volition has helped clients invest over a quarter billion dollars in real estate, there's always been bidding wars for the last decade. Only very, very far, uh, select far and, few, far and few between periods, where there is slight market hesitation, market pullbacks, 
other than that, it's it's always been a seller's market in Toronto. Like, without, without a doubt. And so the fact that we can get conditions is a big freaking deal. It's a big freaking deal. Because otherwise, you're going in blindly. You're going in firm, no conditions. You're going, you have to go firm on financing and firm on home inspection, right? Can't get those conditions in there. Why? You're in a multiple offer situation. Oftentimes, there's like four, six, eight, 10, 20 offers. There's no way that you would have been able to procure a property in a hot neighborhood in Toronto with conditions. It's unheard of, right? So getting conditions, big deal. Why is this a big deal, especially for investment properties? Any ideas? Why is why are conditions? Let me let me make this a little more targeted. Why is a financing condition particularly important for an investment property? Yep. Yeah. I like that answer a lot. So thank you. Sorry, what was your name? It's Kevin. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. That's a very good answer. It's about risk mitigation. I love that because risk mitigation is built into Bullish's DNA. So I love hearing that. Um, so let me reiterate what he what he said. He said, "Oh, it's about risk mitigation because the financing, interest rates, and and, and you know all that other good stuff." Specifically for an investment property, you can't get pre-approval for an investment property. No such thing exists. You can get pre-positioned. You can give the mortgage broker or the mortgage specialist all your documentation up front, and you know they can pre pre-position you. They can run all your financials. They can run your TDS ratios, your, your your GDS ratios, and they can give you what they think is their best guess on whether you qualify or not, or how much you qualify for. But they will not underwrite your deal. They'll not. They won't actually underwrite your deal until you have an accepted offer. They won't underwrite your deal until you have an accepted offer. So they will not actually give you mortgage approval or mortgage pre-approval or mortgage pre-qualification, what the hell you want to call it, they will not give that to you for an investment property in advance. They will, they'll give you sort of a pre-approval, pre-qualification for a private residence, they will not do that for an investment property. So, this is risk mitigation. What this does, it gives you five days, and then in a, in a even softer market, you can extend that to 10 days, uh, financing condition, to actually get your mortgage pre-approval or mortgage qualification. Get your mortgage approval. This is a big deal because even even if even if, if you have an advisor session with me and I go yeah 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 um, put your twenty you know twenty percent down payment twenty five percent whatever down payment and then you should you know if if, if you go or some of our other mortgage brokers say oh yeah you should get qualified for for X you add down payment to mortgage qualification this is what you should be able to buy right in theory but when push comes to shove. You don't actually know that until you have an accepted offer. And in a really hot market, when you don't have a financing condition, you're flying blind. It's not, you know, it, it is a very good best guess and very educated uh, on the part of the mortgage broker, but it still is not 100% until you get that mortgage approval. So this is a big deal for an investment property. Does that land? Does that, do you guys understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Are we, are we? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So it used to be ten percent, right? Hot market, you're coming in ten percent. That's a big deal, especially if the deal falls apart, which happens, right? Like a lot of people come into this, you're expecting it to close, but it happens that deals fall apart uh, before closing, uh, and. Usually you can get your deposit back, but sometimes it's held up for like a year while well, you're struggling with between lawyers and all that. So deposits have come down. Now a good deposit is 5%. Uh, but we are seeing offers come in in the last 5%. We are presenting offers in the percent But I'm also, as a negotiation tech, uh, tactic from our side, we're usually offering 5%, but wanting a lower overall price. 
Yes. Okay, cool. Finance, commission, home inspection, financing. Next. She, she was able to dictate the terms of that deal. For example, the possession. For example, longer closing date. That's more advantageous to her, right? There's a whole host of things you can put in here. So, you know, vacant possession. So let's assume, this is very common in Toronto. You, you've got an investment property, but rents are here. Market rents are here. We're, when we're estimating the cash flow and doing the financial analysis and the performa of a property, we're doing it here, knowing that we're, we're going to acquire the property with existing tenants and their rents here. And we all know it's not that easy to scope from here to here with rents, right? But we can put it on the sellers now. The sellers are desperate. So one of the most powerful things we can do is say, give us vacant possession. And they're like, how do we do that? They don't know. So we're, we're literally teaching these people. We're teaching the other agent, because they don't know what the hell they're doing. And we're teaching the seller, okay, this is what you need to do. It's called cash for keys. You need to get an 11 sign, yada, yada, yada. They come back and go, oh, so you want an N12, right? Owner's, owner's purchaser's own use? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here, Mr. Seller and Mr. Dumbass Agent. What we're talking about is an N11, and it's known as cash for keys. You have to offer your tenant whatever you want to negotiate with them. One month's rent, two months' rent, three months' rent, 10 grand, 20 grand, I don't care. All I know is I want vacant possession on the closing date. That's on you, Mr. Seller. And he's like, oh, uh, okay. I guess that's what I need to do to sell this property. I can't understate how important this is because now, if I get vacant possession, oh, and by the way, we write extremely punitive language into our offers saying, if you don't deliver vacant possession, for every unit you don't deliver vacant possession, uh, that will cost you, there will be an adjustment, an abatement on the statement of adjustments at the time of closing to the tune of $25,000 per unit. Mr. Seller, if you don't honor this contract, it's going to cost you. And let me tell you, that's another really key component. Not asking for a price reduction, I'm asking for an abatement on the statement of adjustments. Does everyone know the difference? I'm already way past time. I'm running, I'm running way past time already. But this is good stuff, so I want to teach you guys this stuff. What's, what's the difference between abate, an abatement on statement of adjustments at the time of closing and a price reduction, which is what most people would do? Austin. Does it impact your financing? Uh, we're, getting, we're getting there. We're getting there. Any other questions? And any other stats in there? Is it like cash in your pocket now versus like Bingo. This this is the key component. I'll give you I'll give you a real life example. So a client of ours bought a property, call it 1.5 million, right? Three hundred thousand dollar down payment, right? Twenty percent. Twenty percent down payment. Follow my math, right? There was a problem. Seller couldn't deliver, couldn't honor the terms of the, the deal because of uh, our due diligence found our due diligence found a problem with the work order because we have again very comprehensive in our offers, so we made sure that work order there are no open work orders as an example. There was an open work order. Buyer didn't know. Uh, seller didn't know that. They bought it with, with the open work order from another seller. This they just kept on kicking the can down the road. We're like, no, 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 we're not, we're not kicking the can down the road anymore. We're dealing with this right now. They were like, what do you want us to do? We said, fix it, or uh, I want an abatement on, on, to be reflected on the statement of adjustments at the time of closing. They were like, how do we fix it? And we said, you don't, we don't have to fix it. We, we knew what the problem is. But they were in a rush. They were really desperate. They needed a quick close. They had another property that they had bought, so they needed to sell this one, yada, yada, yada. They're like, okay, um, how much is it going to cost for this problem to go away? And I, I said, let me go. I know how much it's going to cost. She's like, okay, put it down in the email, send it to me. So what we did, we outlined what it would cost to fix it. We knew that it was going to cost maybe twenty thousand dollars to fix. We said it was going to cost hundred thousand dollars to fix. They're like, okay, cool. They signed on the dotted line. What that did is that abatement on the statement of adjustments reduced the amount of cash that the buyer had to come out of pocket to close. So essentially $100,000 to be reflected on the statement of adjustments meant that her down payment went from $300,000 for that $1.5 million property 
to $200,000 on that $1.5 million property. It did not affect the financing. Is that insane? A $200,000 down payment can only buy you a million dollar property, not a $1.5 million property. So she was jumping for joy, and uh, that is what let her, that's what let her go, when, that's what let her go and buy another investment property, actually. Right? So, anyway. That's uh, a big tangent, and I'm well behind time. But, come on, that was good stuff, right? Don't ask, don't ask for a price adjustment. That's what 99% of the people are going to do. You don't want to be the, like the herd, you want to be better than that. Right? So ask for an abatement on your state of uh, adjustments. So anyway, uh, the point is you can dictate the terms. And you can, you can negotiate directly with the seller. You can understand what the seller's pain points are, and you can solve them. Right? That's, that's what a negotiation is. You're not just trying to grind them, necessarily. You want to understand what their pain points are, and you want to help them solve those pain points. It's hard to do that in a multiple offer situation, right? We've got nine other guys who are just competing on price. What the hell are you going to do? You've got to compete on price. So this is why we really like this type of environment to be able to negotiate directly with someone. So what does this actually mean? So narrating some some nice some nice data here. So if you could, okay, you guys are all new here, right? So you haven't seen. Okay, who is new? What's new? What we do here at Volition is we don't track average home price. Again, that's what 99% of the people do. That's what all the newspaper headlines do. That's what every blog does, yada, yada, yada. We track the home price index, HPI. This data is significantly better than average home price. Why? Well, if I stuck my head in a freezer and my feet in an oven, my average body temperature is still normal. But I'm not doing I'm not doing that well, right? So the problem with average home price is it has no actual it doesn't give you any meaningful insight into the market. But that's what you're gonna read in the in the, in the National Post in the Thomas Star. We track home price index. What's the difference? Home price index tracks like for like asset. Like for like asset. So three bedroom tea bath detached uh, home in C01 in you know, downtown Toronto, for example. That tracks it month over month. You can track condominium, you can track townhouse, you can track semi-detached. You can, you can, right? So the point is, is that you can now track like-to-like -like asset because let's just say in any given month, a bunch of condos sell. If a bunch of condos sell, you can all agree condos are cheaper than homes in Toronto, right? If a bunch of condos sell, your average price in Toronto comes down. But that doesn't mean my home actually dropped in value. That's why it's a stupid measure. You understand? So home, track, home, home price index is what we track here at Volition because it's a lot more meaningful. So what we're demonstrating here is a snippet of what we normally does. Ming, Ming normally does the Ming's market minute, and he, he'll kind of go over this data with you. We're not doing it tonight, but I took a snippet of it to show you something. And so what we're seeing here, all these different lines, if you look at the blue, blue is Toronto, Toronto proper. Uh, the purple, that's the that's the uh, blue dotted line. The purple dotted line is all of Trev. So that includes like Richmond Hill, Aurora, um, you know, all those other places. CO1 uh, is red. That's the one I want you to look at, CO1. Because that generally is kind of the downtown Toronto core. Uh, you could look at EO1, EO3, and those other ones too, but just look at red for now, right? So, before I get into Gina, Let's go, let's take you through a little bit of a history lesson. What, I, what those vertical lines represent, so you pro, as you probably, probably can imagine, this is the home price index, so it goes up, goes down over time, month by month. That's what we're tracking here. The vertical lines in, indicate the interest rate hikes, right? So, where, where, when was the first interest rate hike? Back in like March uh, 2022, right? Quarter point hike, April. Half a point, and then June, half a point, and then July, full point. Right. Yada yada yada. We 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 know all the interest rate hikes that have happened over the past uh, year and a half. But what you might not have seen is that interest rate hike mapped against actual home prices and the home price index. This is why this chart is extremely useful because you can see 
the impact of, of the interest rates on home prices. Not average price, because a bunch of condos sell brings down average price. That's not helpful. What's helpful is tracking, this is tracking detached homes in, in Toronto, in these various areas. Now look at the red line. So you can see prices at the end of, you probably can't see this, so I'm just going to highlight. Around here, red line, it's tracking on the upward, oops, it's tracking on the upward trend here, right? That is the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. Prices are on the, are on the rise. Then, like I said, March 2022, interest rate hike, right? So that interest rate hike started to slow the market. You can, you can start seeing it slow. Then that another a half point hike, things started slightly coming down, and then, uh -oh. and then by the time that you hit the one percent hike, things started dropping significantly. So you can start seeing what happened. The little bit of hikes in the beginning started slowing the growth. Then the super size hikes started make things come down. So, and then you can track it for the rest, right? And then it, it started, it kind of bottomed out around September, October, November last year, right? And then you can see it stayed, it stayed low for a while. It started rising when the Fed, not the Fed, the Bank of Canada, lowered the interest rate hike to quarter point and then subsequently, so that's a quarter point here. Shoot, sorry, something's wrong with this. Quarter point here and then zero percent. Then it held rates steady. So by February and March of 2023, they started holding rates steady. And that's when the markets are taking off again. So what happened here, I'll tell you something that none of the newspaper headlines told you. All the newspaper headlines told you, oh, the reason that interest rates, uh, sorry, uh, the reason that um, the, the real estate market has taken a downturn is because interest rates went up, meaning that payments went higher, right? Right? That's what all the newspaper headlines said. Oh, payments are higher. People can't afford it. That's why That's why the real estate market has taken a nose down. That's only partially true. That's not fully true. It's missing another truth. The other half of that is buyers didn't want to be buying in an environment of uncertainty. Buyers did not want to be buying in an environment of uncertainty. This is really important because not, no one else is talking about this. And the reason we know this is because by the time they start holding rates steady, the market took off again. Interest rates didn't come down, payments didn't get lower, they held rates steady. That, what that indicated to the average consumer, the average buyer, they indicated more stability to them, right? They, what, they, what they believed at that point in time was, okay, we're done with these supersized rate hikes. We're in an environment of certainty now. That's why the market came back, okay? Yeah, you got less than 20 minutes now, so the sizzle is sizzling. Okay, Flo was telling me I'm running right too slow. Okay, okay I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speed this up. Okay, but, but, by the, by the time that we reach mid-year, they start hiking rates again, right? So that's what happened. Inflation, could keep it in check, raise rates again, from quarter point, quarter point. And then in September, they finally held it, or September, October, they finally had it, um, September, they held it steady. The next one, the next rate hike, or, or announcement is end of October. Here's the funny thing. In September, when they held rates steady, it didn't, it didn't signify to the market confidence again, even though they held rates steady. Why? They didn't trust Tim Macklem anymore. Previously, they held rates steady, and they were like, oh, okay, okay, this is the end of this rate hike cycle. Now, they held rates steady, but the language associated with the rate hike, uh, the rate being held steady, was, we're going to leave the door open to future rate hikes, just in case, right? So that is not signifying stability to the market, and consumer confidence has, has not quite resumed as a result. What this means, and I haven't extrapolated this data into the last couple of months, but what it means is that we're still in a we're in a dip still. We're not we're not in market recovery quite yet. Alright? So anyway, coming back to Gina. So that's that was the history lesson of interest rates uh, and its effect on the Toronto market. Coming back to Gina. So Gina bought into the dip. Look, 
red line, it's dipping, dipping, dipping. She bought, not perfectly at the bottom, she didn't time the bottom, there's no such thing, but she bought into the dip, and she got favorable work pricing as a result. Right? Make sense? All right, so lesson learned for Gina. She accidentally bought at the right time. Could the market have continued on a downward trend? Yes, it could have very well, but she accidentally bought at the right time. She didn't get caught up in the newspaper headlines. She stayed above the fray. Uh, you cannot time the market, no matter how you try. You can't time the market. But she did get favorable pricing. Um, she got conditions, which reduced her risk. Thank, thank you, Kevin. She bought it on her terms. She dictated the terms of the deal, as I mentioned before. The seller paid her the existing tenants. Uh, no competition. She got to know the seller. The seller's pain points, and she helped solve those. Desperate sellers provide an opportunity as well. What kind of opportunity? Opportunity for creative deals. Here's one, VTB. Here's another one, 0% VTB. Imagine getting a 10% uh, 0% VTB for one year or two years. And if you don't even know what I'm talking about, then come talk to me later, because I can't get into it, because flows up kick my ass. Imagine 10%, a 10%, 0% VTV. That lowers your down payment by 10%, but doesn't increase your monthly financing by an extra 10%, because you've got a 0% VTV, right? So for the more sophisticated investors here, you might, that, that might land for you. Uh, what else do you do? Agreements for sale. You can even joint venture with the seller if you are, let's say, a, a, a fixed, you know, a, uh, a renovator or a fix and flipper or something like that, right? Maybe you don't even need to close on the property. You just joint venture with them. You don't need to close, pay land transfer tax and all the other crap, but you take control of the property through the joint venture, you fix it up and sell it or, sell it or rent it out or whatever, right? There's so many different ways you can do this. Creative deals can be done in this type of environment. All right, since I'm running out of time, Tommy. What did Tommy do? Tommy was the wait and see guy, right? So what did he do? He was the deer in the headlights. So. In uh, mid 2022, when Gina was clear, calm headed, Tommy was freaking the hell out, just like the rest in the market, right? So what did he do? Nothing, actually. He waited and he missed the boat. So he was in the wait and see mode in 2022. He eventually did buy, and he bought in spring 2023 when the market recovered. He wanted to see evidence that this market wasn't going to be this, you know, this catastrophic, you know, downturn for the next 50 years or some, some crap like that, right? So he bought during the recovery. What did he do? He, what did he buy? He bought, he bought a similar property to Gina, makes $7,500 in rent, but he paid 1.57. Gina paid how much? 1.35, thank you. Right? Tommy bought when there were eight other offers. Tommy did not get conditions. Tommy did not get any of the terms he wanted, like vacant possession. He had to assume the tenants. Still a great property. He still bought a really solid investment property, but could he have done better? That's the question, right? So, where, when did Tommy buy? Sorry, this thing's not working. Okay, anyway, you can see Tommy came out of the dip, followed the red line. There was a dip, he didn't buy into the dip, he bought coming out of the dip, right? Arguably, you could get similar pricing, actually. Arguably, you could get similar pricing coming out of the dip as into the dip. So, oh, if I can buy out of the dip, there's more certainty, right? So that's, that's better, right? Price is not the only thing. This is what I'm trying to convey to you. It's not just about price, it's about this other stuff. This other stuff is really, really important. It's not just about price. Price is one aspect of, of, of the deal. One important aspect, yes, but it's only one aspect. So anyway, what I want to get to you is the lessons learned here. Don't be paralyzed by fear. This is what most people do. This is the market, the market uh, sentiment at the time. Everyone was freaking out. Stay above the fray, right? And don't be influenced by your negative cognitive, cognitive bias. So your negative cognitive bias was a very important uh, uh, survival tactic. In our survival brain, our reptilian brain, when we were all kind of prehistoric cavemen, right? Why? Well, it was really useful for, to, you know, if I saw some like leaves rustling over there, it was really important for me to think that's a tiger, right? I might be wrong, but the 99 times I was wrong means one time I might be right. And that one time would save my life, 
right? Because that would be a tiger, and I'd run like hell as a result. The problem is, is that we don't want, we no longer live in that type of environment. But we're, we're humans are still hardwired for severe and extreme not negative cognitive bias, which means we tend to exaggerate the negative and actually minimize the positive. So it's hard to operate with that type of uh, uh, cognitive bias, but at least be aware of it and be aware of that of its influence over you in your decision making. Okay? Shoot the puck. Just don't stoop, shoot stupidly. Still, buy. If you want to buy, and it makes sense to buy, buy. Shoot the puck. You, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Just be smart about it. Make sure that you still have good economic fundamentals and good risk mitigation in place. Now talk about the irony of the market psychology. So here is the irony. Everyone wants a deal. Every freaking one of us wants a deal. Oh, I want a deal, I want a deal, I want a deal. Oh, I want a, you know, I want a deal, right? But when it comes to actually acting, and when that, when it come, when that deal actually comes, when that, when that deal crosses your, your plate and crosses your desk, you freeze, you get paralyzed. You become too afraid to act because you're, you're worried about this and that and the market hysteria. So when does everyone actually want to buy? Everyone actually wants to buy at peak because that, they think that, oh, when market turns, it actually is the best time to buy. It creates opportunities, creates deals, it creates opportunity to negotiate down with the sellers, to get the terms you want, to get favorable pricing, etc., etc., etc. But what happens? You freeze, just like Tommy did. Right? This is why I want us to remember the oracle, be fearful when others are greedy, and greedy when others are fearful. What would, what's your take? What would you say to that today's environment is? Are we in a greedy environment? Yes? We are in a fearful environment, very much so, right? So I'm not saying go out there and buy anything. Don't be stupid. Buy good, solid investment properties, good performers that will still perform in the long run. That's what's key, right? All right, let's go move on to our last guy. So the ugly, good, bad, and the ugly. So this is uh, John Bon Giovanni, right? He's still awesome. What happened? He bought in a catastrophic scenario, but he's still awesome. What happened exactly? He bought at market peak, early 2022. He bought it, he bought that similar property to Gina and Tommy actually, $7,500 in rent at market peak for 1.6 million. He bought at peak. And what happened? The next day, not literally, next weeks and months, but practically speaking, the next day, the market dropped the 200 grand on him. Oh my god. OMG. OMFG. Right? Like, oh my god, how could this get any worse? Timing couldn't have been any worse than this. But he bought, he was smart. He was still a smart guy. On top of being good looking, he was a smart guy. Right? He bought a solid performer, which meant that he could hold on long term and he was not forced to sell into the downturn. So he didn't freak out. He stayed cool, which is, which is easy for him because, I mean, look at him. I could not be cool. He bought at market peak. You can see, he bought right there and the market started tanking right after that. Worst possible timing, right? It sucks, absolutely. But the question is, is it the end of the world? Is it the end of the world? Now the question that you're probably asking then is, how can we be sure that it's going to recover? Oh, it's down now, but how can we be sure it's going to recover? I wanna, I'm going to answer that with the next couple slides. I've got a couple slides here that I'm just going to describe the importance of holding for the long term. Right? Raina, this is what we were just talking about. It's holding over the long term. And then the other thing I want to talk about is that I don't want to catch a falling line. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that guy catching a falling line. Fair enough. Let's talk about that. Education time. All right. Let's uh, put on our nerd glasses, our pocket protectors, and let's, uh, let's get into it. How can we be sure that our market's going to recover? What I want to get into, I want to change the conversation. Most people will go, oh, okay, well, let's look at the market, market historicals. Right? Oh, it's, it always comes back. I want to talk about 
I want to talk about this in a different way. The way I want to talk about this is I want to answer the question, what fundamentally underpins and drives a real estate market? What fundamentally underpins and drives a real estate market? That's the question I want to answer. It's not the right question to go, oh, um, how can I be sure the market's going to recover? This is the right question to be asking. On the left, we have market fundament uh, economic fundamentals. On the right, we've got market influencers. Let me get into that a little bit. Economic fundamentals are things like economic growth, GDP growth, job growth, industry growth, population growth. Rental demands, vacancy rates, rental rental rates. Those things are the things that fundamentally underpin the market and ensures that it has longevity over the long term. What we see here is down here, this is economic growth and job growth, and up here is real estate prices. It is it is roughly an 18 to 24 month cycle. If you, if you see an area with job growth and economic growth and industry growth, in about 24 months, uh, that will lead to a conditional uh, an effect on a positive effect on housing prices, right? On the right, this is the stuff that you see in newspaper headlines all the time. What do we got here? Interest rates. Has that been part of the headlines lately? It's not. Can't read. It. Can't. A day doesn't go by and you don't, you don't read about interest rates. Ease of borrowing and the availability of, availability of capital and finance. Uh, is it harder to borrow these days? Stress tests and this and that and the other, rise mid straight. Yes, I'd say. That's what we see all the time. Confidence in real estate as an investment vehicle. Oh my god, is there a crash? Oh my god, this, oh my god, that. Inflation. What about inflation numbers are 3.8%? How the hell do I know that? I know that because the headlines said that this morning. Right? Legislative legislative amendments. That's basically uh, government intervention. Making this law and that law and this bylaw and that bylaw and all the other stuff, right? Foreign investors in local real estate. Foreign, oh my god, foreign investors! They're the ones buying everything up and driving up prices, right? And uh, investment alternatives. What else you can invest in? The difference between economic fundamentals, which are the things that un fundamentally underpin and drive the real estate market, and market influencers, which are things that have a temporary, non-permanent effect on the market. Market, I'm going to repeat that. Market influencers have a temporary, non-lasting non impact on the market. That's not, not to say it doesn't have, it's not to say it can't have a drastic impact on the market. That's not to say that the impact can still, that can still last several months or years, but it's temporary. It's not permanent like the ones on the left. The reason I bring this up is because to answer the question, how can we be sure it's going to recover? We don't have a crystal ball as to when, but we do have confidence as to the fact that it will recover. And not just, not just because markets are cyclic, but it's because at Volition, we dive deep into this data on the left, the economic fundamentals. We know Toronto, for example, the market we service, and the market that we believe is a very strong market to invest in, has good, strong economic growth, has good population growth driven by immigration and this, that, and the other. Uh, headquarters are here, finance, uh, bank, bank headquarters are here, tech is here, healthcare is here, insurance and finance, professional services are here, yada, 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 right? So Toronto, strong market from an economic fundamental standpoint, meaning that it will recover eventually. When? Can't say that for sure. No one has a crystal ball. But we know, due to the economic fundamentals, that it will recover. Make sense? Okay, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Market influencers, though, for sophisticated investors, creates an opportunity. Market influencers for sophisticated investors who don't get freaked the hell out, creates an opportunity. Right now, is that opportunity? Right? So, now we get to the parts of building the long, long term. So, let's take a look here. So this is a nice smooth graph. The reality is probably a lot more bumpy. But just imagine, you buy a property for 1.5 million, right? $300,000 down payment. That's the, that's the left, the, the green arrow there. That differential between the market price, that's uh, sorry, the uh, uh, property price, and in red is the mortgage balance, is $300,000. That's your equity that you injected as you down payment. Make sense? 
Over the course of 30 years, so you get a 30 year amortized mortgage, you pay down that mortgage. Simple, the blue line, over time, at 5% growth year over year, it's an upward trajectory for that line. The differential is your equity. And at 5% growth, you can turn that $300,000 of equity or down payment into $6.5 million. Why? Because property prices in 30 years at 5% growth will be about $6.5 million and mortgages, mortgage balance will be zero if you pay down that mortgage. Right? Make sense? The thing is, is that, again, this is my nice smooth line. I'm an engineer, Trina is an engineer, most of my friends are engineers. Engineers are really, are such a pain in the ass. Uh, engineers love to poke holes in everything. They want to poke holes in all of your arguments. And the argument they want to poke hole in here is, oh, but you're assuming it goes up in value. What if it doesn't? Oh, yeah, you're right. What if it doesn't go up at 5%? They, let's, let's say it was just a 2.5% thing. You still have turned $300,000 into $3 million of equity over 30 years. At 0% growth. This is assuming you think real estate's not gonna grow a dime over the course of 30 years. You can still turn $300,000 of equity into $1.5 million. And here's your catastrophic scenario. Over the course of 30 years, if you have, you don't even believe in real estate and you think it's gonna tank, if it, de if it declines 2.5% year over year for the next 30 years, your $1.5 million property will come down to, to 700,000. 700, and here's the kicker. You still have turned three hundred thousand dollars of your of equity in the form of your down payment into seven hundred thousand dollars in a down market. Is this landing for you? This is the importance, Reina, of holding for the long term, right? So the reason I'm, I'm singling her out to rich having this conversation, she's like, oh, I have this pre-construction condo. Is it better to flip? Is it should I do this? Should I sign it? You know, how long should I hold it for? I'm like, hold it forever. <laughs> Hold it over the long term, right? That's where the real wealth is built. Make sense now? That's why I couldn't answer you then. I had to, I was waiting for these slides. Okay. All right. So as, as you probably see, John Bon Giovanni, you know, scenario three, catastrophic. It dropped 250 grand in the first year. Oh my God. Or in the first couple of months. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, it sucks. But is it at the end of the world? The reality is, the market's probably gonna do some, something like this. Even if it doesn't, it might do something like this. Even if it doesn't, the it, question isn't the end of the world. If you bought smartly, the answer is no, it's not the end of the world. Oh, here's a bonus for you. Everyone's talking about interest rates. I wanna show you the impact of interest rates over the long term. Here's, here's a graph, same graph, using 3% interest rate. This is 5%, this is 10%. I'm gonna go back. 3%, 5%, 10%, 3%, 5%, 10%. Did you see the difference? Did you see the difference? I did. <laughs> the difference is the steepness of that curve, the mortgage balance curve, right? It gets a little, little steeper. Obvious, this is its impact on real estate over the long term, assuming that we stay at 10% interest. Everyone's freaking out about interest rates, but they don't understand that, that interest rates don't have the type of impact over the long term that you think. Obviously it has an impact, and that impact is very singular. Its impact is on cash flow. Its impact is on the fact that you're gonna take, you know, your monthly mortgage is gonna cost more. So I mean, it does make it more difficult to invest in real estate. I'm not saying it doesn't. What I'm saying is it doesn't have an impact over the long term if you're able to hold over the long term. So that land, that makes sense? All right. So the point is stop focusing on all the other crap in the market. Oh my God, the market, oh my God, interest rate, oh my God, inflation. Stop focusing on that stuff. I'm gonna challenge you to focus on the important stuff, like economic fundamentals, like risk mitigation. So how, how, do, you, how do you make it risk then? I, I'm not gonna get into this too deeply, but the way that we mitigate risk here at Volition is we use an acronym called TIME. And we ask people, is it time to invest in the market? T-I-M-E. T stands for tenants. As much as you might think interest rates and all the other crap, tenants are actually the biggest risk to your business. Tenants are the biggest risk to your business. Bar none, hands down, end of conversation, right? The best business model risk. 
Are you employing the right business model? Are you doing a flip in a down market? Are you doing other risky type of stuff in a market? Maybe you need to rethink that business model. And maybe, maybe employ a different business model. So understanding and employing the right business model at the right time and under the right market conditions helps you mitigate risk. Uh, market risk. So this is the stuff that everyone talks about. Is there a bubble? Oh my god, interest rates. Oh my god, this. Oh my god, that. Right? That's the stuff that we read about in the newspaper all the time. Last one is the state. The actual property itself. If you're not buying the right property, the right type of property, and you, know, you don't have a good investor lens, uh, you're not bringing one of the volition investment realtors along with you to when you're when you're analyzing properties and checking out properties, you might not be buying the right property, and you might be opening yourself up to estate risk, property risk. Okay, but I don't want to catch you falling in. All right, so I don't want you to focus on the actual. Sorry. Okay. Almost done. Flo. Almost done. All right. I don't, don't focus on the on, on the details here. This is just a slide that shows uh, inflation-adjusted property prices in Toronto over the long haul. This is this is since the fifties, right? So you can see basically you can see the late the late eighties, um, you know, all the way through twenty sixteen. It's not up to date. I'm not trying to show you this data. I'm using this graph as an illustrative point. What I want to show you is, oh, it's a little light. Can you still see the green line? Yeah? Okay, just in case. Yeah. Just in case. Okay, that's the green line, follow the green line. So we, what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is two concepts here. Buying into the dip versus buying out of the dip. Buying into the dip is what we're talking about right now. That's what scenario one, Gina, Gina the action taker. That's what she did. She bought into the dip. Versus Tommy. Tommy bought coming out of the dip. And there's an argument to be made, you can get the same price. Because obviously going into the dip and out of the dip, you can get it at the same price. That's not the point. And hopefully that point I've been trying to hammer home, hopefully it's landing for you. That's not the point. That's not the only thing associated with the deal. The terms, the conditions, all this other stuff, risk mitigation, that stuff is equally important, as important as getting it at a favorable price. So even if you can't time the dip perfectly, it's better being on this side of the dip. Uh, I've already talked about this stuff. So deal terms, yeah, 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 whatever. Uh, a couple other things you could do. You could, if you wanted to do renovations, you could get uh, drawings, you could get all of the survey, you can get this, the, permit submission under the seller's name if you negotiate the long close and get them to transfer it to you upon close. There's so many different things you can do. You're only limited by your creativity. You can get, you can, if the place is ready, you can advertise it for lease, right? And so then on day one, instead of taking possession then advertising it for lease and, and going through a month or two, you can advertise, advertise it for lease and have a tenant there on day one. There's so many other things you can do, right? Conditions we talked about, negotiating power, and creative deals we talked about. Okay, double dipping. Let's talk about double dipping. All right, so. <laughs> All right, I'm almost. This is this is it. This is it. Okay, I'm gonna do this really quickly. Okay, right now, for argument's sake, we're buying. Right now, we're going into the dip. Right? So we just talked about it. that combined with. Winter seasonality dip creates an unprecedented opportunity. We're going into winter right now and combined with a market dip. Market dip plus seasonality dip. In the winter, people don't want to be out shopping. Uh, yes, there's less inventory, but there's a lot less buyers. And typically sales volumes are a lot lower. People who need to sell during the winter, if they're selling during the winter because they can't wait. Otherwise, they wait for spring. So this Typically, the market's a lot slower, and you can get quote unquote deals. Combine that, involve that with the market dip, and you have a double dip opportunity here, just like George Costanza. You need to be thinking, if you're serious about investing, you need to be thinking about this now and preparing yourself into the December, the colder months, remember December, January. Santo, what, 
what are you bringing for Christmas? What he's, gonna, what he's bringing on his sleigh for you is a well-priced property. That's what he's bringing for you, right? This is, this is the opportunity. This is creating an unprecedented opportunity, and you need to be working with Lucian now to get prepped. Even if you're not pulling the trigger, you need to get prepped in October, November, so that in December you're ready to pull the trigger on something. So I those conversations need to start now, okay? All right. I'm live flow. Okay, let me go this really quick. All right, strategies in a higher interest rate environment. Okay, good. All right, increased revenue. Um, okay. But basically, the first one just says, do renovations. If you do renovations and you don't refi to get that capital back out, you can increase cash flow. Uh, write better ads, just more elbow grease, right? Write better ads, take better photos. You don't, even though rent is 2200, doesn't mean you get 2200. You can still get 23, 2350, 24, if you're better at it than anyone else. Uh, do things like rental garages separately, your parking spaces separately, storage separately. You can put signage on your property. There's lots of things you can do to increase revenue, right? Decrease expenses, it's not even getting clogged into that. Um, rethink financing. So, higher down payments. Clients down, 20% down, yes. Very tough, very tough, very tough. 20% down, very tough to find anything like cash flows 20% down. 20% down is an artificial thing construct anyway, right? It's, it just happens to be what everyone thinks you, you, you should do. Thir 25 or 30 points down might be our new reality. In order to get to where we need to be, where we need to be on the cash flow front, do that for a year, but then refinance later after interest rates drop. When are interest rates going to drop? That's another slide. Maybe another one. Um, another one is reamortize. If you have a mortgage right now that's like a 15-year mortgage because you reamortize it back into 30 years, so you can increase cash flow. Right? Structured note. Basically, you can get like 10% on a structured note. If your mortgage rate is at 6%, uh, take it out as a mortgage still, invest the difference in the structured note, and you can increase cash flow in other, other ways, right? Okay. Large down payment, I talked about it. The impact of a 20 to a 30% down payment, yes, it's $150,000 more on a $25 million property, but it can move cash flow from negative 800 to about positive 100. Capitalize your negative cash flow. If you have negative cash flow in year one, capitalize that negative cash flow, meaning have it ready in cash right, upon acquisition. To the tune, if it's negative 800 bucks for a year, that would be about 10 grand. Right? What I'm showing here is a few little slides from last month, but basically, the smart money is predicting which trades are going to fall by about 1% in the middle of next year, or towards the end of next year. Right? So if I, if I use that 1% mortgage drop, it drop my mortgage from 6% down to 5%, and it'll drop it by whatever. Anyway, that combined with higher rents over time, 4% rent growth, for example, gets you to positive cash flow in year two. Capitalize your negative cash flow in year one. Just call it the cost of doing business for the, for the benefit of getting a property $250,000 under, under market value. And this is, it's, it's much more palatable, right? Okay, really, really quick. Go. <laughs> I'm, I'm done after this. Are you, okay. Are you, are you, are yes. You I'm, done. I'm done. She's here. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Point is, can you project out Tommy, Gina, and and Bon Bon John Bon Giovanni? You'll see. For example, going back well. Depreciation at five percent growth over ten years. This is the amount of equity growth each one of those. Uh, experiences over the course of 10 years. Gina, awesome scenario, made 1.25. The bad scenario, made just over one. And then the ugly scenario, bought at market peak, then this, then that, still made. Turn out, turn out, uh, had equity growth of a million dollars. The point is, hold over the long term, it erases all these mistakes anyway, even if we're wrong, right? So, Basically, this is the opportunity right now. Scenario one, Gina, is what we're seeing and experiencing in the market right now. If you freeze, and you are in wait and see mode, and you are deer in the headlights, markets always recover, and you would miss the boat. And in the worst possible scenario, like the market drops 200 grand tomorrow after you buy today, isn't that bad if you're smart about it, it is uh, right? The actual worst case scenario is doing nothing. Because as you can see, 
you actually have an opportunity to build a million dollars of equity over the next 10 years with a property like this. And if you do nothing, and you wait, and you don't buy anything, and 10 years down the road, that opportunity is there. Okay, so what's out there right now? As an example, 1.55 can get you a triplex, again, it's about $8,600 in rent, which is absolutely insane. I, I'm like, wowza. Uh, this is cash flow positive, that 20%. 20% down payment, 80% loan value mortgage. This is not the norm. Ming was saying, this is probably the best property we've seen all year in 2023. It's available right now. Actually, one of our clients is going to What? It's under contract. Oh, it's under contract, you bought it. Okay. Um, so, this is no longer an opportunity. But, I'm gonna give you a sample of what's out there. Final thoughts. Yeah, whatever. Scenario one is playing out right now. Scenario two, less ideal, but, uh, catch it out of the dip, still not the end of the world. But even if we're wrong, scenario three demonstrates market uh, risk mitigation, and it's not that bad of a scenario. So contact us, us for specific uh, opportunities. We have a lot of off-market listings as well. Pocket, off-market deals. Question for you, if we were to go deeper into some of this stuff, the fundamentals, uh, how to mitigate risk, what the best investment business model is for Toronto, and what it is that you're supposed to buy, and how do we be sure that Toronto has longevity? We teach this in a weekend mastermind course. What kind of appetite, what kind of interest would you have if we were to put this on early, let's say early next year? <laughs> is there. What? Uh, maybe what we can do is leave the call to the end, or make sure that there's enough time for us to know. And I also want to make sure that we've got time to know. Because there's a lot of people in the room tonight, and I mentioned in the intro, like the networking is super important. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk to each other and have uh, that networking. So uh, maybe after Austin speaks tonight, we can go back to this poll and see what people are looking for so we can start planning out future events. Yeah, oh, sure. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. So, uh, okay, guys, so we're going to take minutes. Uh, we're going to have our networking. Um, like I said, Say hi to your neighbor. Everybody here is interested in real estate. We can talk about that some day. We'll see you guys at 8.13. Okay, the, the star of the evening, the, the reason you are here is to hear Oscar Austin Mayer yeah, speak. Um, damn, I didn't realize he's 28 years old. I only found this out when we were chatting on the phone. Because uh, this young man has a, a, a wisdom of a, of a middle aged man. And, um, Anyway, lots of lots of experience uh, flipping, lots of experience wholesaling, very successful wholesaling business. Um, I'd say very, very insightful and uh, wise insights. So, you know, I, I'm expecting gold tonight, no pressure, uh, and I'm sure that's why you're all here too. So. Please give it up for uh, my friend and uh, our guest speaker, Austin Young. Thanks for the uh, kind introduction, Ming. And I uh, appreciate you guys uh, coming out today. Uh, I'll try to I'll try to get through this quicker. If uh, anyone has any questions, feel free, and I will uh, I'll elaborate on a couple of points. Um, but just a quick introduction on myself. As Ming said, I'm a 28 year old full time real estate investor and entrepreneur. Um, I bought my first ever real estate property, uh, when was that, November 2018, so about five years ago. And since then, I've scaled to over 50 units, comprised of over 20 properties in Windsor, Sudbury, in Toronto. Sold a couple of off since then. I'm also the founder of uh, Rise Network, which is a real estate community. You can find us on Facebook. We also host events as well. Um, podcast host with 275,000 downloads. You can just find it on Spotify or Apple. Uh, worked in audit, consulting, strategy, commercial banking prior to uh, doing real estate full time. Uh, completed over 10 joint ventures and raised over uh, $5 million uh, throughout my investing journey. So, this topic is going to be all about joint ventures, but taking a step back, um, we're going to talk about OPM real quick. It's a common acronym that uh, you're going to hear in real estate investing. It stands for other people's money. The most common form of OPN is bank financing, which I'm sure as real estate investors, all of us use. We're not putting 100% cash in a lot of the investment properties we buy, but we shouldn't be. 
we're putting 20, 30, maybe 40 percent, and we're getting the rest from the bank. There are other forms of OPM, other people's money, so private funds, seller financing, also known as vendor takebacks, real estate syndications, crown funding, and joint ventureships, which is what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into that, over my investing journey, I realized to be able to scale, you need to use several forms of OPM. Not solely just bank financing, but you need to mix it up with joint ventures, with private money, whether that be secure or unsecure, or seller financing, vendor takebacks. And that is what allowed me to scale my portfolio at uh, a rapid pace. Awesome, joint ventureships, what is it? It's nothing new to real estate, it's actually a business concept. You see a lot of corporations use it. Basically, it's when two or more parties pool their resources together uh, to be able to accomplish a goal. In the business world, for example, you guys might not know this, but Nestle and KitKat have a joint venture to sell KitKat's products in Canada. Whereas in the US, um, Hershey's and KitKat have a joint venture to sell KitKat's products. So essentially, it is just partnering up to reach a common goal. In real estate, that is partnering up to buy an investment property. And there are three elements or resources that make a successful joint venture possible. It is the money, the people, and the deal. Money is straightforward. To buy any sort of investment property, you need money. You need a down payment and you need the renovations and you need to be able to qualify for financing, right? To make a deal successful, you also need people as well. So your contractors, property managers, lawyers, accountants. And the last factor is deal. Obviously, when you're getting into a joint ventureship, you're buying a property together, you need to make sure that that property is a good deal. And that's gonna come down to what's the potential, what's the upside, what's the risk, what's the return on investment. So when you have a joint ventureship that has the money, the right people, and the right deal, it will be a successful joint venture. One party, the common, we're gonna get into the structure a little bit later on, but the most common form is, is there's gonna be someone that brings in the money typically someone who's either high net worth, high income, high savings, and the other active partner who's gonna be doing the work is gonna bring in the people and the deal. Again, we're gonna get into the structure a little bit later on. So when I got started in real estate investing, it was so hard for me to wrap my head around um, raising money from other people. I always thought that money was the most valuable resource. People who have money can find their own deal, they can hire their own contractors, they don't need to partner. But that couldn't be further from the truth. And we've seen this in different market cycles, right? So what resource is actually the most valuable? During the expansion and the peak of the market, which was 2021, 2022, there were almost no deals. Everything was being picked up, there were multiple offers everywhere. You had to search tooth and nail to find a good real estate deal. There were almost no contractors available. Property managers weren't doing their job properly because there was so much demand flooding the market. But everyone had capital to invest. If you made a post on Facebook, on Instagram, about a good investment opportunity, everyone would be reaching out to you. So during the expansion and the peak, I would argue that having the right people and having the right deal is more important than having the money. You can find the money after that. But in the cycle that we're in, going into a recessionary and eventually a recovery, Capital is the most important resource. So people with capital can demand more in your partnership because financing is very difficult. You're qualifying at a nine, eight to nine percent rate. And also inflation has gone up. So people's savings have gone down. They have less to invest. As well as finally, people who have money may not be willing to take action yet. They may be trigger shy, right? So capital becomes much more important Deals are everywhere, as, we, as it looked like me and Matt talked about earlier, it's all over the market, it's off the market, but no one's absorbing this, right? So the deal becomes less valuable. And also the people, contractors, I have five or six contractors that I've used in the past who are reaching out to me for projects because they can't get any work, right? So depending on where you are in the cycle, will dictate which resource is most important. And you can structure your JV partnership around that. So we're gonna get into the typical joint venture structure. Okay. Um, so typically, how most people go about advertising it is, is that you're gonna have two parties, an active partner and a passive partner. 
the active partner is going to bring the right people and the deal, and the passive partner, aka the capital partner, is going to bring the money to fund the deal, so the down payment and the renovation. You split the profit 50-50, you split the losses 50-50, and again, that's the general sort of structure here. Again, this is just a quick high level, we're going to get into more detail as we continue on. Why don't we skip to this and I'll go back. Um, some of you guys might be thinking, if this is my first ever joint venture partnership, how am I going to convince someone to give me all the money while I do the work and bring the people? And it was definitely a sticking point for me when I got started. I didn't believe that I could do it. And so as a result, I had to adjust my joint venture structure. So what I, laid, what I mentioned before was a typical structure, but you can be as creative as you want. These are real examples that I've done. As a new investor, when I raised money for my first ever partner, they bought in 100% of the capital, but I agreed with them that whatever money gets stuck into the property, so let's say he puts in 100,000, we refinance out 50,000 hypothetically, so he still has $50,000 tied in. I agreed with them, I would put half of that money in with them upon the refinance and whatever capital is tied in. Right, so that's a little bit different than the normal structure of a JV. Also, I decided to hold the mortgage. For me, I was new, the borrowing capacity didn't matter as much, so I decided to hold it. The capital call, so any sort of capex that happened with the, build, with the building would be on the responsibility of the capital partner. That was important to me because as a new investor, I wasn't very liquid, so I needed to be, I needed to, in my head, I needed to make sure that I could be able to predict my liquidity and by having constant capital calls, that would add a little bit of, um, that wouldn't add assurance to me at all. The profit is split 50-50. That was my first structure. So as I became more experienced and as I did more JVs, I asked for the typical structure. So they bought in the money, they held the mortgage. We split profits 50-50. They're responsible for the capital calls. Um, and they're responsible for any money tied in after the mortgage. But here's the main thing is, is that they do recoup all of this money on the sale of the property before profits are split. And that's an important point. If you have, if the partner has $20,000 tied into the property, when you sell the property, they're gonna get that $20,000 back before you split the profit, right? So you're incentivized to get as much profit as possible because that's how you're gonna get paid out. And during the market slowdown, I had three JVs over the past year during the slower market condition. Each of them were structured a little bit differently. So I had to step back and adjust my structure because capital was difficult to raise and I understood that environment, so I had to make changes. So I had the capital partner bring in 100% of the capital up to $200,000. Anything above that, I would cover. So the project went over, it was $240,000. I paid that 40,000 out of my own pocket. Right, that gave them reassurance. Any money tied in, we would split it after refinance. So I think it was about 70,000 tied in because they, we'll get into this later on, they're only able to qualify a 62% loan to value at the new appraised amount. So we had a lot of money tied in, but I put in half of that, they had their other half tied in, and we would split we would split any capital calls, right? So the windows need to be replaced five years later. I agreed to split that with them. My structure evolves as the market evolves, as capital becomes either, either easier or more difficult to raise. Now let's go back real quickly, and then I'll we have more slides, but I'll open the floor to any questions as we, as we go on. Um, so the joint venture structure, it's gonna depend on your experience level, the time of the market cycle that we're in, what the active partner's needs are, what the passive partner's needs are, and there's so many different variables that you can play with. And I feel like newer investors sometimes don't get too creative. They like to follow a specific framework, but you can be as creative as you want in these joint venture partnerships, right? So initial capital, are they gonna pay 100% of the initial capital, or do you want them to only pay 80%, and you can put 20% out of pocket? Or they can agree to pay X amount, and anything above that, you will cover. Right? So you can get as flexible as you want. Cash flow, do you want to split that 50, 50, 60, 40? Maybe they receive all of the cash flow until they recoup their invested capital and then it gets split after that. Capital tied in, are they 100% responsible? 
Are you guys splitting the capital tight end? Are you doing 60-40 on the capital tight end? Put up and split, capital call. It's all basically the same thing, right? You can play around with anything. Um, and sometimes there are even more factors that you can play around with, like timeline of the JV. But be as flexible as the needs of your JV partner and what you're willing to accommodate, right? Don't just think in this one box that it has to be 50-50. They have to put all the money down. Realistically speaking, again, when times change, you have to change your business model accordingly. So, quick question. Um, I'll get back to this. <laughs> Let's open it uh, up to any questions so far because the content is going to get. Yep. That's the question I have for you. So, how do you find your partners, right? So, you're talking about social media, like where, do you, where do you get your partners from? Yes, we're going to get into that, I think, probably in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So. Is this being recorded? We're going to record it after? Right here. Right here. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> like how you have an official like Oreo form for purchase to sell you. Is your official form for joint venture? So that is going to be a contract that your lawyer is going to need to draft up. Technically, you're not entitled to the property. Technically, you're not an owner of the property. You have vested interest in the profits and loss of the property. Right. So. There's no APS adjustments. It's going to be a separate contract between the lawyers to, to figure out. This is not legal advice, by the way. <laughs> we have the disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sorry, what's a capital call? Anything? Yeah, capital call is basically when you own a property, things come up. Plumbing leak, maybe the windows need to be replaced, and those are like capital calls, right? It may not happen when you buy the property immediately, but it could happen four or five years down the line, and you gotta figure out how you're gonna split that cost. Cool, I guess we will move on. Um, quick question How many of us have marketed ourselves on social media or shared our investment journey? Show of hands. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta we got pump those numbers it's up. It's very dangerous to do that. Sadly, from the Volition team. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> One person. I don't even know those symbols. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hands up again. Uh, whoever, whoever has used social media. Okay. I read so for you guys, did you have success right out of the gate in terms of raising capital or getting interest from, from anyone? Raise your hands if you have. Not, not very common, but close. Um, usually it takes a lot of consistency to be able to gain the interest of people. People want immediate results. For me, I was on social media for a year before I ever got my first ever um, JV partner. And I started Rise, and after four or five meetups, I started gathering more attention. It wasn't immediate. Money always comes when you don't need it, and it disappears when you need it the most, right? So make sure to go on social media, and then put in that effort and value yourself. Cool. We'll keep this slide pretty short, but uh, attention equals currency. Um, you might have heard Grant Cardone say this if you guys follow Grant Cardone, but it is definitely true. The more eyes you have on you, the greater the chance that you're going to be able to raise capital, right? Um, everyone's on their phone, everyone's fighting for your attention. Your friend who just posted that they were on vacation is fighting for your likes. Advertisers who want your business are fighting for you to buy the product or their service. And yourself, as an investor, needs to be able to fight for the attention of other followers on your, uh, um, yeah, the followers that you have. You can earn attention, spend it, or lose it, but you want to focus on earning attention, okay? I mentioned this really brief. The more eyes on you have on you, the more money you'll raise. It won't be immediate, it will take time, um, but as long as you're consistent, and this is really a simple formula that you can follow. When I talk about building a brand, attention is really important, but to, to complement attention, you also need a brand, okay? I'm gonna use a corporate example and then tie it into real estate. So for me, I have a background in finance, so I always try to think of myself as analytical, and I try to think of every decision I make with having some sort of rationale. But realistically speaking, even though you think that, oh, I might be analytical, everything I'm making is a rational decision, it's not. Emotion plays a large part of every single one of us in the decision making, whether we know it or not. And a good example is Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. So in the 1980s, Coca-Cola was 
had the leading market share compared to any beverage company. Pepsi wasn't even competition. Everyone told themselves rationally, Coca-Cola tastes better than Pepsi, that's why I'm here for Coca-Cola, right? Pepsi wanted to put that to the test. 1983, they had one of the greatest marketing uh, campaigns of all time, known as the Pepsi Challenge. You guys might remember, basically, they had a blind taste test, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. The vast majority of people preferred the sweetness of Pepsi, not Coke. So even though people rationally told themselves, I prefer Coke, turns out that wasn't the case, and Pepsi outsold Coca-Cola for the first time in 1982, okay? What did Coca-Cola... What did Coca-Cola do? Remember, they're a valuable brand because of their branding and uh, their marketing, not because of the flavor of their drink. They decided to change their formula and they got significant backlash. And what they did instead was they doubled down on their branding and marketing and they became the fifth valuable most brand in the world. That's as of 2021, that might have changed. But um, yeah, like it just goes to show that branding makes a big difference. So when we talk about branding in real estate, it falls into a couple of buckets here. Does someone like you? Do they know you? Do they trust you? Do they relate to you? And then they'll look at the numbers of deal, then they'll partner with you. That was another thing as well that I had trouble understanding when I was uh, beginning raising capital is, is that I focus solely on the numbers. Um, and it makes sense where people want to invest in a profitable deal. But let me ask you this. If someone bought you a highly profitable deal, but you don't trust them, are you going to invest in them? No, there's no way, right? The numbers come secondary to who you are. If someone knows, likes, and trusts you, and relates to you, then they'll give you a shot. Then they'll look at the numbers. Then they make the cycle part of it. But if you don't have this part figured out, the first four buckets, you're gonna have a challenging time raising capital. And just uh, as a quick anecdote, one of my JV partners, very sophisticated, senior director at, uh, at a large company, when he JV with me, he almost overlooked all of the numbers. He took a quick glance at it and said, Austin, I trust you. I've been following your journey. And uh, that's not what I expected, even from someone from like, a, I guess an executive level in these companies. But really, they, they said that they liked me and trust me and that's why they decided to invest with me. Numbers do matter, don't get me wrong. You can't be bringing people crap and expecting to invest. But the first four buckets, I think we need to start with that. And then after that, we go with the, the analysis of the deal. Okay, quick summary, why do we brand, build an image, gain trust, position yourself as your expert, uh, sell yourself, show how real estate's gonna help in other people's lifestyle, and most importantly, you wanna attract capital, not go out and try to try to get it. You want people to come to you. Okay, we're gonna talk about establishing that ideal JV avatar. I'm sure you guys don't want the guy on the left to invest with you, probably those two people on the right. Um, but this is something that's overlooked by a lot of people, and we're gonna give an example of, of how I messed this up and sort of the pain points that I've had with it. But uh, you gotta figure out who your ideal JV partner is, right? Like this is like marketing 101. You gotta figure out the demographics of who you want to invest with. And then you gotta create marketing material to hit their emotions and create blog posts, articles, so on and so forth in order to have them connect with them. The more specific you can get about your partner, the more likely you'll be able to target them, get their attention, and then eventually raise capital from them. So my JV partner, someone in the late 20s, uh, to the late 30s, they're a white collar worker, ideally making six figures plus. They may have mediocre job satisfaction. They don't have a lot of time on their hands. Maybe they want to invest in real estate or do a side hustle. Uh, they own their house. They have at least $150,000 in, in cash, ideally more. Um, they have money in the stock markets, uh, and also they're married, or they're to be married, they plan to have kids, so they don't have time to invest. And this is important, they need to understand real estate at least a little bit, and we'll get into, the, into a little bit more detail when I give an example. But uh, they need to understand real estate's a long-term investment, not a short-term investment, uh, which a lot of people get mixed up. And it's a great wealth builder and has good ROI, again, when you look at 10, 15, 20 years, not a year or two. Empathy map. So once you have the demographic all laid out, you want to build yourself a little empathy map. So with your demographic, what do they think and what do they feel? What do they see on a day to day basis? What do they say or do? What do they hear? Right? And when you build this out, you can create content to better target these different emotions, right? For example, um, my JV partner, they may say, 
I wish I had more vacation days. Or I want to invest in real estate, but I don't know how. Or I want to side hustle, but I don't have the time to do it. Or real estate is complicated. I wish someone can show me the way. Um, it could be a very different, they could be many different things that they say, but it's important to build this map out and it's going to help you with content creation. All right, one second. <laughs> <laughs> Go click on it, man. I wanted to. I mean, was a quick link. Yeah. I wanted to show you some example of posts that I did. You can start with the first one. <laughs> we'll do one day. We can send this out later. All right. Anyways, I'll summarize. Uh, basically, it's a photo of me traveling, and I talk about my goals of eventually wanting financial not having to worry about vacation day, my plan to get there, right? And that really resonates with my, my target demographic. Um, I show a network post, one real estate post of deals that I've done, and uh, a personal post to just have people like me, right? So the real estate posts and networking really get people to, where is that? To trust you, because if you're going out and networking, it shows that you're putting in the effort and work to connect with other people. When I show my real estate deals that I've done, as people know, I ask people to continue to trust me as well. The personal posts will have people like me and relate to me. And to have people know me, I put the traveling posts to show what I value, right? So everything that you should do should be done with intention. It should fall into one of these buckets. So go with that. Um, after this part, I'll open the floor to questions again and then we continue moving on. I'll summarize this. I'm sure you guys are already familiar with this platform, so I'll try to keep it short. But LinkedIn, professional platform. Um, it's where you show your milestones, your accomplishments. You want to post long form content on LinkedIn. High value add, and you don't really want to have too much of an ask in LinkedIn. People don't like to be sold. Uh, I have a couple of LinkedIn articles that I'm going to show you eventually. But it's all about building credibility on that platform. Facebook, generally an older audience, usually in their 30s to 50s. Um, people you know may have lost touch with maybe your friends on Facebook. Uh, Medium-sized content on there. Again, it is uh, mostly a high-value ad. Um, and in Facebook, you want to focus on quality over quantity, right? Instagram is going to be the quantity over quality uh, social media that you want to use. YouTube, um, YouTube is surprisingly overlooked, and I did tamper around with YouTube early on in my journey. I stopped because it's very time consuming, but YouTube is a short, medium, or long-form content, and it's all about positioning yourself as an expert. When I was making YouTube videos, I was getting 15 or 20 views, and I was thinking that it was useless. But those 15 or 20 people who watched me became um, dedicated to following my journey. Now I can't, I don't know if it directly translated to any sort of JV partner, but it definitely helped me with the credibility aspect. If you have the confidence to go on camera and speak to any topic for 10 minutes, whoever's watching it is going to think that you're very knowledgeable on the topic, right? So it's a great credibility uh, builder, and it helps people know, like, and trust you because they can actually see your mannerisms as well. Instagram, younger audience, um, it is a narcissistic platform. It is your, it's your highlight reel. If you guys use Instagram, you'll see everyone post every successful deal that they do. And it's all about quantity over quality. Instagram is a fast-paced, moving social media platform. Everyone is constantly sharing stories. Everyone is constantly posting on it. So you want to post frequently. Or at least have stories frequently. Um, I break up Instagram into four categories. So usually I'll have a personal post to have people like me and know me. I'll have an educational post to educate people on real estate investing. Because you don't want a JV partner that knows nothing about real estate, as you mentioned earlier, right? So you gotta have some educational element in there. Motivational post, and then just a random post as well. All of these usually, again, cater into one of the four buckets that I mentioned earlier. And then Twitter, I don't use I personally don't use Twitter. I creep it pretty frequently, so I understand the platform. A lot of it is uh, streams of consciousness. It's surprisingly, you wouldn't believe it, but it's very data heavy. Generally speaking, the Twitter posts that are data heavy and opinionated tend to do well. Um, they offer high value and minimal ask. With this platform, 
platform and you plan to post on it, you want to post again at a high value and then convert these people into Instagram or Facebook where you can easily at, have an ask. But having an ask on Twitter is a little bit weird. Likewise with LinkedIn as well, you don't want to have an ask on there. You want to convert them to your other social media platforms. Um, that way it's easier to have an ask on Instagram and Facebook because it's more personalized. TikTok, uh, platform with the quickest uh, potential growth. I don't know if you guys use TikTok, but sometimes I'm scrolling through and I'll have someone with zero likes appear in my newsfeed. The algorithm makes no sense, but it is fantastic for creators like us because everyone has an opportunity to go viral. You don't need to provide a ton of value on TikTok, to be honest. It's all about engagement, a little value is fine, but uh, you want to push these people against your other long-form platforms like, uh, like Instagram or, or Facebook. Um, but it's another great way of, of, of uh, branding. Always leave with providing uh, value first. A lot of people have the habit of making an ask. Again, if no one knows who you are, no one's going to care. Add value first, um, do it consistently, and then eventually you can have an ask. Okay, how can we produce content to attract investors? We'll keep this, I don't think the links will work, but I will uh, summarize what's going on here. Um, on LinkedIn, I had an educational post, came to a Volition Properties event. I learned, uh, I think it was the time acronym, I made a post on it, right, and I explained it. Right, nothing revolutionary, just something that I learned on an event, created a quick five minute article, threw it on LinkedIn, had an engagement on there. Position myself as an expert. Uh, during COVID, I bought a property, I created an article for my thought process of why I bought that property, right? So people understand uh, my, what, where I'm coming from, the reasoning, my thought process, and again, position myself as an expert as a result when everyone um, was shying away from investing in real estate. Education's not enough. You want to post what you've been up to. So these are some properties that we purchased, but even if you haven't purchased the property, if you analyze the deal and walked away from it, that is just as meaningful, right? Because you can explain to your audience what didn't make sense with this particular deal. I honestly don't do that enough, but I'm going to start doing that more and more often because you're not only educating people, but it's also showing that you're taking action as well. Show me what you do. I didn't see anyone take any photos, but it should be because you need to post stories consistently, right? Show people that you're out to these networking events, right? Because otherwise, if you're not investing in yourself, no one's gonna invest with you. If you make one story that you went to a networking event a year ago, no one's gonna remember that, right? You need to be consistent. You need to be, you need to be in the front of your audience at all time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll always show what you're doing. Even if it's the smallest thing, still show the audience what you're doing. Okay, um, before I get into so these are going to be some of the risk of KBs. I'm going to stop here for now. Any further questions on what we discussed? Branding, social media, so on and so forth.
Sorry, what was that? Yeah. Yeah. What's the color you use LinkedIn as a launch pad for your social media? Like, for example, you made uh, content on, on TikTok, YouTube, or Instagram, you post them on, on uh, LinkedIn for most of your network. I missed that last part. Um, <laughs> you posted, posted your content on, on, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, the content you made from uh, YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram. Are you correct if I'm wrong? You're saying do I re do I post on LinkedIn the other content yeah, that I made? Yeah. No, not on LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn is a little bit less frequent. Again, it's high value. It's when I have something very meaningful to share that I think people are gonna get insights from. You don't want to wrap and post on LinkedIn. That's a quick way for people not to take you seriously. So even on LinkedIn, if you post once every three months, I think that is sufficient. Obviously, more frequently the better, but you gotta be careful with that platform. It's, it's a little bit less forgiving, so I, I don't share everything on there. Any other questions? Perfect. We'll jump on the race with babies. Uh, I'll try my best to give some examples that, that I've been through myself, but one of the biggest risks is, is that your JV partner doesn't understand real estate and investing, and as a result, let's say they go on Instagram, Instagram's a highlight reel, and they start building false expectations, right? From, from people who say, oh, I got all my money out on every single deal. Um, you want to make sure that your JV partner understands the risk of, uh, of investing in real estate, potential non-payment of rents that could happen. If that situation pans out, how are you going to deal with it? Right? You don't want them to, you don't want the first time they learn about this to be when it actually happens. Educate them on every single element, but let them know what you're going to do to mitigate it as well. But they need to be well aware of it. Capital source, over leveraging via HELOCs and lines of credit. So a lot of JV partners pull out money through HELOCs, nothing wrong with that, but when you're at an 8% HELOC, that can be pretty stressful, right? Um, and so you need to let them know, you need to ask them where the capital source is coming from and make sure that they're comfortable and have the stability in their job to be able to cover that interest. If they're not comfortable with that, they need to have that money in cash. If they don't, they may not be, it, they may be a long-term investor mentally, but. I don't think they will have the liquidity to hold long term. You can have the mindset of being a long term investor, but if you don't have the liquidity, you're gonna ultimately sell them short term, right? Um, expectations not aligned. This happens from time to time, happened with me and my JV partner. Um, he was expecting a broker, even though I told them it's not like guaranteed, and uh, it, it didn't happen, and he was upset, right? But we beat our projections. So make sure, again, when you speak with these JV partners, to let them know what your expectations are in the JV and ask them what their expectations are bluntly and readjust the PV. Overly active. I have JV partners that like message me over every little thing. They want communication over everything, even though they're supposed to be the passive partner. Um, that was my fault because at the beginning I was open to handling that, but as I scaled my portfolio, it became much harder to manage. Um, so be prepared for that. Set your expectations, that communication will be done via email. I'll get back to you in 24 to 48 hours. Operational disagreements. I've had this with JV partners as well. Um, in some particular neighborhoods, tenant quality may not be great, so your best option may be to attract students. My JV partner didn't want students. Tire back and forth, we disagree on how to operate it. Ultimately, they should be relying uh, on your judgment call as the expert. And if there's not, there's probably a lack of trust. Uh, oh. And counting pennies, not dollars, this is probably going to be the most common problem you run across in a joint ventureship. Um, they care about every single dollar, understandably so, they're investing their money. So I had a situation where the roof was not in good shape, it needed to be replaced, and they wanted it to get worse before having to replace And it did get worse, there was a leak, and it ended up costing more money to fix, right? But you want to make sure they look at the bigger picture and not count every single penny. And understand that, again, things come up in real estate, right, but it's a long-term investment. All JVs have the risk of financing, so as, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I had a JV partner qualified for financing on purchase, couldn't qualify and refinance. Make sure that they're able to qualify both at the beginning and your, your, your end goal, right? Um, so that's one thing, lack of control over the JV's right decision. I've had a s this is recorded, so I'll be careful. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you want to hit pause? <laughs> yeah, so, um, I can hit pause. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get across is that people will make their own financial decisions. 
decisions in life, understandably so. Your JV partner may invest with you, and then they may do their own investment. And if their own investment doesn't go well, they may you may have to sell your property because they're in a tight situation, right? They don't have full control of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I had a partner that before refinance, they bought something very expensive, uh, finance, and they financed that purchase. And as a result, we weren't able to refinance his money out. I can't control his life decision, right? He didn't run it by me before doing it, so his money's tied in, right? Um, and you'll have a lack of control of your dream. You can't babysit what they do on a daily basis. Counterparty risk. Basically, what this means is, is that your JV partner may have defaults, they may miss on certain payments. So, how are you going to deal with this? Uh, oh, if you stop, we can record again if you stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, counterparty risk, like the, the defaults, if they miss payments or anything like that. I've had a joint venture partner that uh, basically they had a ton of capital. Uh, capital call came. Uh, they were like, I have no more money. I'm like, dude, what happened? Uh, they bought a bunch of toys uh, that we probably shouldn't have, and I had to fund that. It's not my responsibility, but I didn't want utilities to be cut, so I put my own money in there. Uh, market risk. We're going to get to that in the other slide, so I'll skip that for now. And JD partners can actually sell. They're not allowed, they're not legally allowed to. But it is possible they sell your property without you ever knowing, especially if you're not registered on title, right? Um, yes, they can get in trouble for it. Yes, you can sue them. But it's going to take like two to three years and tens of thousands of dollars and a lot of headache. So you want to make it's, it's ultimate, even though you have a piece of paper signed, it is really based on trust. Yes. Can I ask, um, going back to the avatars? Oh, yeah, no, 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 you're on the right side just now. So, a lot of this is making sure you've got the right personality in the direction, right? What can you do? Do you have any advice around mitigating that risk? Like, how do you find that person that's going to not count pennies on the dollar? Do you have any advice around that? Here. <laughs> We'll get to it. <laughs> we'll jump into that and then I'll, I'll address it. Um, okay, other risks to consider resource strength. The more JVs you have, more communication, more reporting, more of everything. And and, and so I I have my admin help me. Um, so I'm, I'm not basically making any sort of cash flow. All of that's going to the admin to, to deal with all of these. So you said reporting. Are are these actual reports or? It depends on your JV structure. In my structure, and most JV partners do want some sort of like high level overview, what expenses, what revenue. It could be monthly, it could be bi it's whatever you negotiate with them. If you're able to negotiate no reporting, then you don't have to report, right? But most JV partners do want some sort of uh, reporting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot to communicate. The more JV partners you have, sometimes it could be a little bit more of a headache. So I've been doing repeat partners. Someone who invests with me, who buy multiple properties with me, that's to help me solve that issue. Market timing risk. Um, if you acquire too many properties, too many JVs on one go, and I've, I've sort of had this situation in 2020 when COVID first hit down, when COVID first happened, I had like three properties that were closing with JV partners then the world shut down. And uh, basically I, I exposed myself to market timing risk with me and all my partners, right? Um, I overpaid for multiple properties. Thankfully, it rebounded, but uh, people were uncertain at that time, right? So when you do JVs, don't think that you can start raising capital. It's like, I'm going to do 100 deals at one go, because you are exposing yourself heavily to the timing of, of when you're buying that property. Locked in capital. If you're structuring it such that you're giving in 50% of the money as well, after refinance, and you have like two JVs going on at the same time, and your appraisals don't come back favorably, you're going to have a lot more money tied in than, than you might like, right? So Again, you gotta, you gotta figure out the structures that you're gonna have with these JVs. Capital call, if you're responsible for splitting capital calls, then, uh, and you have a ton of properties uh, with JV partners, multiple things will eventually end up happening, happen to me as well. Like sometimes it's two or three properties that need capital calls, and I need to take money out of my account, and uh, essentially help the JV partner cover them, right? Just growing pains of a, of a larger portfolio. Um, Timelines. So if one partner wants to sell and another doesn't, how are you gonna deal with that situation? Usually your JVs are a five-year contract, so in five years they can renew it 
or you can sell it. What if that ended the five years of markets and it did? And then JD Parker panics and they want to sell. You're gonna have to cover 50% of the loss, right? Like, so that, that, is, that is something to consider as well. Like, what are the timelines for the HKBs? And set that expectation up front with them. Time commitments um, and expectations, as I mentioned, they want an answer immediately. Make sure you let them know that it takes 24 to 48 hours. Changing regulations. Uh, so UHT, that's the underutilized housing tax. If you have JV partners, you would likely have to file for the UHT if you haven't already. And there, who knows if there's any regulatory changes in the future about joint ventures, right? You can't really tell, but UHT is one of them. If you don't do it, you got a $10,000 fine, right? And I, I am on my JV partners, but to do it, some of them haven't done it yet. I've given them full instructions and video tutorials on how to do it, right? But um, that's a risk, because if they get fined $10,000, even if you remind them, they're gonna come back and just yell at you. Make sure to have a lawyer draft up any joint venture agreement that you have. Okay, so ways to mitigate this risk. Uh, one of them is, is, is really targeting your, your ideal JV avatar, right? And, and not straying too far from that. That's where I got into a lot of my problems is by partnering with people who are not my ideal avatar. But also it, it comes down to qualifying, right? Just like the JV partner is gonna qualify you, you have to qualify them. It's, it's a two-way partnership, right? So you need to make sure that the partnership ultimately makes sense. Some questions to ask. What are your expectations in this joint ventureship? And share them all out. Then lay down all of your expectations, right? See what aligns, what doesn't align. Can you figure out an agreement? If not, may not be the right partner. Timelines, what are their timelines? What's the ROI they're expecting? Are they expecting a full burr? What strategy? Uh, how much capital tied in? How about cash flow? Are they okay? If, let's say interest rates go up and it's cash flow negative for a short period of time, you want to lay all of these out and have a full blown conversation. People want to avoid tough conversations, but uh, it's easier to have them upfront when there's no financial commitment from either party than when both, both parties are, are, are tied to the end. What's your employment? Is employment stable? Understand the financial situation. Um, what's their borrowing capacity? Are they pre-approved? Do they have any other big purchases going forward? What do you consider a successful JV? Set the expectations that it's long-term. What are the expectations of communication? And this is your responsibility. Explain the risk, right? And be completely transparent on it. Tell them how you're going to mitigate it, but they, they need to understand that mitigation doesn't always mean that it's not going to pan out. It could still potentially pan out, right? So they need to be well aware of that. Okay, two more slides left. I'm gonna stop here for now. Any questions on the, the risk? So this is um, a, a risk. So you have a JV partner, and worst case scenario, passes away. What kind of insurance or what kind of, um, what do you do in a situation like that? Like how would you deal with something like that? Definitely discuss with your lawyer. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm just. That, that, that's the main thing. I think. Uh, try to remember. If it is a tenants in common where if someone passes away, then the park spouses uh, assume the property, right? Yeah. Goes, yeah. To, goes so, to the estate. What was that? Joint goes to the estate. Yeah. Joint tenants, it goes to the other partner. Exactly, tenants yeah. in common, it goes to the estate. So, so that's even a common thing in regular real estate transactions, right? Generally speaking, it's going to be your tenants in common, which means that if they pass away, it's going to go to their wife. Um, but again, keep in mind, you're not entitled to the property. So if at, and if at any time the wife's like, I'm going to sell it, and I'll let this person know, and we'll take all the money, they could do that, and you're just going to have to sue, right? So a lot of it is based on trust, ultimately. Unless you want to put yourself on title, but then you'll have to qualify for the mortgage as well. Any other questions? Awesome. Okay, legal considerations. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm talking about. Um, okay, first thing. Do not solicit funds from the general public if you are selling shares. Okay? Um, some people structure JVs in different ways. Commonly, it's just like a contract partnership written among both parties. That's usually okay. But if you're structuring your JV such that for whatever reason you're selling shares, that is that that is regulated by the Ontario Securities Commission, right? And you can get yourself in trouble uh, by saying, "Hey guys, who wants to invest with me?" And then, yeah, you're not allowed to raise money. You're not allowed to raise funds. Okay? Speak to a lawyer to understand the rules and the don'ts. 
Um, typically, if you're doing a JD, you are able to market it on Facebook and Instagram as long as it, again, is like sort of that typical JV contract partnership. Um, but do not advertise the returns publicly. Don't tell them anything's guaranteed. That will get you in a heap of legal trouble. Um, save that for a conversation. You can show them projected returns, right? I wouldn't even put that out there publicly because that could still bite you in the butt. But show them projected returns in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. This is what I expect. Don't guarantee anything, right? Base case, worst case, best case, and see if they're okay with that and have that conversation with them. Don't promise returns, you'll get in trouble. Don't say you'll guarantee returns. You can show projections, but again, never guarantee those projections. Ideally, you want to raise capital from your family, friends, and business associates. But uh, for me, I, a lot of them didn't really have a ton of money, and so I had to go outside my influence. That's okay, as long as you speak with the lawyer to understand the do's and don'ts. Um, if someone reaches out, make sure to have a conversation with them, multiple conversations, not just one. Text message, phone call, Zoom call. Document it um, so that you have proof that you had a long-standing history of conversation with this individual. And in case it, it ever bites you back, you have that evidence there. Frankly speaking, again, speak to a lawyer. My opinion, not really necessary, because you're not doing that. You're not going against the OSC by doing that, right? Like this is more sure to protect from the OSC, but as an extra layer of uh, measure, you, you can do that. So, uh, deal sheet. So, I don't know if this will, uh, this will open up. This is off the internet. You can just double click the PDF. Basically, you can make the deal sheet as complicated as you want or as simple as you want. I simplify my deal sheet, and if someone has questions on it, then we jump into it and we can analyze more numbers, right? I'll, I'll show you a quick example of the deal sheet. First page is highlighting what the address is, the purchase price, the estimated after repair value, renovation cost, closing date. You can go to the next. Uh, I talk about the area. So this particular property is located right beside the university, literally the first street over. I highlight why that's important, uh, how that's going to funnel into our business plan. You can go to the next slide. The house. I talk about the property itself. What is it? It's a legal duplex, the structure of it. Um, if it's vacant possession, so on and so forth. And in the next slide, I talk about what we plan to do with the, with the duplex, right? So I go over the strategy, next slide. Uh, and this is just, this is more so how much money is needed from the investment, closing costs, down payment, repairs, so 122,000, next slide. This is the detailed scope of work as to uh, what the renovation breakdown is going to be. Next slide, same thing, the total rentals. Um, here are the comparables. So when I highlighted the ARB on the first slide, I want to show the data behind it. So I noted that there's no duplexes that sold, so I'm just comparing against single family homes, but our property would be more valuable than single family homes. So next slide, same thing. These are listings, not necessary. There wasn't much sold data, so I just put some listing data as well. Okay, and this is if we got an ARB $360,000 with all of our uh, with all of our initial investment, we're able to pull out $100,000, only $20,000 would be time to the problem. Right, so a quick math there. Next slide. Cash flow after refinance. I just highlight what the rental income is expense. And on the left, I explain my logic behind the cash flow. Next slide. Um, so when you're doing a burr, you're doing renovation, the value of the property is going to go up. So I show how much appreciation we're forcing. The, the forced appreciation is going to be the bulk of the return in the first year. Um, but then that shows the ROI metrics there. Terms of the joint venturship, as we discussed before. And then this is the long-term sort of uh, ROI. Keep in mind, the numbers look really big because only $22,000 is tied into the deal. Right? When you're cash flowing $1,000 a month and you only got 22 grand tied in, with equity pay down and appreciation, that adds up to be quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go as detailed as you want. Some people want to see an internal rate of return, multiples of invested capital. I don't put all of that in my slide. If people want to see that, we can have a conversation later, right? But reality is not everyone understands like every single metric. You got to put the ones that everyone sort of understands are the most important. And again, if people have further questions and want to see further numbers, then you can have that discussion off of just the deal sheet. Um, but yeah, I try to keep it simple. That basically concludes the uh, presentation. I think we covered 
to cover the risk, we cover how to raise money, what KB is, the structure, the legalities, and the deal sheet. Uh, so we'll turn the floor to any questions. Covered everything. Yeah, that's any, why. Any questions? Now's your chance. Anything about JVs? Repeat the question. Okay, so he was saying that we covered the numbers, but where's the people part and where's the deal part, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a totally sort of separate topic on its own. The people part's all about how to build the power team, right? Um, I don't think we have, I'll try, I'll try to concise it, right? Like you're gonna, you're gonna have to be able to interview contractors, property managers, boots on the ground people. Um, you're gonna have to have a game plan of who's gonna lease it. Um, so that is like not, that, that's like an expectation of any investment property, not necessarily a JV. The deal part, that is, I could do an hour presentation on that. That's like deal hunting, right? Negotiations, advertising to find off market deals, how to assess deals on the market. Um, for the sake of this conversation, it was just more so the structural part of the JV, but we can chat offline if you wanna get more detail around that. My first JV was pretty well. Uh, my first JV partner is actually Mayu Thava, if you guys like, he's the co-host of the Rise podcast. Um, so that one went well. My worst JV partner was my mom. Uh, <laughs> that was an do, do you want to turn this off? <laughs> uh, <laughs> she knows, she knows. Uh, yeah, I mean, direct family, people have different opinions. It is challenging because the dinner table, every time you visit, is gonna revolve around business. Especially if it's not doing well. Yes, and we've had a tenant problem with her property that I was dealing with because I don't know why I get it. They're less understanding. <laughs> Kevin, uh, I was just curious. Are you still uh, like scaling up your GVs, or are you? Do you have like a next step that you're looking at? For I have people in an email list where I send out sort of like the uh, the deals to. I'm not opposed to doing JVs. I like it. I've learned a lot from it. I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, the ideal for me at this point is to, to just have more control, so do things myself. But uh, again, I will continue to do JVs in the future. Uh, just at this point in time, with the opportunities I'm seeing, I would rather keep 100% of the pot. <laughs> can you expand a bit more why? You talked a about JVs. Yeah. How you say you're I have the capital. Right, I have all, like I have the capital, I have the money, uh, not the, I have the resources, and I have the. I am actively hunting for a deal, so I'm a wholesaler. So I don't need to go out. Before I didn't really have the money, and so I needed that portion. But now, when you have all three, you don't necessarily need a JV. It's optional. Well, I, I'd add on to something that it was not directly said, but you know, a, a lot of what we're doing in real estate investing is you know, there's a large number of people who don't want a loss. And when you're doing JVs, you're trading the boss of your company for multiple bosses that you're sending monthly reports on financial status of the investment property. You're not escaping that dynamic. Uh, Matt and I are, are the same. We're open to JVs in a very limited capacity now, right? There was a, a time, and actually it was probably around the time I met, like eight, nine years ago, where we were much more you know, into taking capital. Um, but it's a trade-off at the end of the day. You're, you're, you're trading that dynamic, so. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, okay, so just to extend, for people who are just starting out, would you recommend, with all of your experience, to start small with a small property on your own with whatever money you have, or to leverage a JV 
and do a big a bigger project with a better ROI. Can you repeat the question for one? Yeah, so the question was when you start off, are you gonna do something small yourself or should you just go out and try to find a capital partner? Um, for me personally and my part of the journey, I wanted to prove the concept first. That's how I feel. It depends on you and your personality. I have a tough time convincing others without doing myself. So I did something small. I got confidence around it. I understood the operation, so on and so forth. And I felt like I could provide value. Then I went to raise capital. That being said, if that's an, it's not an option for everyone, right? And so if your only other option is to partner with someone, if this is your first deal, I would recommend you both have skin in the game, right? Um, just to show, again, like that you're, even though you're learning, you're willing to put your own capital on the line as well. That's what I did for my, I wouldn't, you could call it a JV. For my second property, first one I did myself, second property, I put in 50% of the money. I don't really consider a JV, but I guess you can. And my buddy put in 50% of the money, and we both did the active work together. I would lean towards that um, as, as a first investment. I think the question was how can you structure a deal uh, in a scenario where you've got somebody as a full money partner and you've got somebody as a full skill partner, like a, an investor partner? Okay, okay, so one party is bringing the money and the other party is bringing the people and the deal. Okay. So there's no perfect answer to it, right? Uh, what I wanted to get across is that you can be as flexible as you want. Typical structure is, is that someone brings the money, they hold the financing, um, they deal with the capital call, or you can split the capital calls 50-50, it really depends. And the other person does all the work, and you split everything 50-50. That's a typical structure, but if you cannot raise money that way, you have to be flexible with your terms, right? Um, so there's no, there's not really an answer to that question, right? Because if I provide an answer to it, it's giving you, it's, it's telling you exactly it needs to be this, this, this. In reality, it could be anything that, that you want it to be, right? But typical structure is, is what I mentioned before. Okay. Um, knowing what, having the team, etc., and management, 
This is not property management, this is asset management. So on an ongoing basis, who's taking care of the place, who's making the decisions, who's the first call the property manager is going to call. They're not, they're not, they're not gonna call your busy avatar doctor or high power lawyer or whoever. They're gonna call you, right, as the real estate expert. So for that, one basic way you can think about it is 25% to each bucket. 25% for money, 25% for mortgage, 25% for mastery, 25% for ma uh, management, asset management. And thought of it that way, it gives you a little bit of a framework to at least think about it. It's not rigid, it doesn't have to be that exactly, but it gives you an idea of where the important components that come together to do a deal. So does that help? That was basically my question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, if people are interested in following him, if they're not already, how, how can they uh, do so? Aren't they here because of him? Yeah. <laughs> they followed him? Instagram. <laughs> At Austin Yay 6 A-U-S-T-I-N-Y-E-H-6. I thought I saw Living the Dream for or, some, or something. Is that... <laughs> Mixing it up. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's a round of applause for all